Welcome everybody out there. I hope you're having a wonderful evening. This is Julian Rankin with the Walter Anderson Museum of Art. We're here for our seventh and uh, final program in our Southern Art Wider World Series. Just hanging out in the pre-show with Zaire Love. Zaire, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing good. This is our last, you know, hurrah, I guess. Yeah, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. You know, it's uh, 2020 is almost over, but we, uh, we're going to go out with a bang. We're talking about food food tonight with some wonderful guests and we'll introduce them in just a minute. But um, before that, I did want to talk about food. I mean, you're up in Memphis, such a wonderful food tradition up there. We're down here on the coast, of course, and we're going to talk a lot about seafood. But um, when, when do you, do you remember a, a time like when you tasted a dish or maybe it was at someone's house or maybe it was at a restaurant when you realized it was more than just ingredients, it was, there was a story in it. Ooh. I guess that's a lot of food. Yeah. Um, I guess the 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 type of food that comes to mind is my grandmother's sweet potato pie. And that is it's like you you know, people like there was a whole craze about these patty pies before the Patty LaBelle pies that are sold at Walmart and how people are just like going crazy over them. But that's how me and my family go we go crazy over my granny's sweet potato pie. It's like when you taste it, it's just like, oh my word. Like, what do you have in here? What did you put in here? And honestly, my granny gets orders from family members saying, hey, at Thanksgiving or hey, at Christmas, I need three pies. <laughs> I need four. I need two. And we're going to freeze them so that we'll have them, you know, weeks from now, but I'm pretty sure they're eating before that time. But that sweet potato pie, like whatever she does, whatever type of magic she puts in it, like it is, it is, is definitely one of those experiences that I, I, I remember, cherish, and I look forward to on Thanksgiving and Christmas. Oh man, well I bet you're gonna have one here in a week or so then. Oh for sure. Well, great. Well, we, you've been to La Bakery, and one of our guests tonight is Sue Wynn, owner of La Bakery. And um, we've got the mayor of Biloxi, Andrew Fofo Gillich, with us. And moderated that this evening will be by Francis Lamb, the celebrated food writer. Well, they'll get they'll all get a full introduction here in a minute. Um, but now that y'all are here, I want to tell everybody watching if you're watching live, give it a share. Tell us where you're from. Um, throw in your comments and questions during the live stream. And at the end of it, we're going to take some of those questions, answer some of those, and also see uh, maybe you have some food stories you want to share. Uh, so we'll see you on the other side here. We're going to get into it. It all starts the southern part of the map. The influence the globe ain't nothing harder than that. We way smarter, in fact, than the stories that you heard about us. Determination and birth the image. We learn the progress. It's all a process. Rebuild and regrow. When the value's much more than the silver and gold. See the stories passed down through the soil and the dirt. And we rose from the ashes, so we loyal to the earth. And we royal from our birth. See the beauty of the landscape. Gulf Coast waters crashing on the sandbanks. It's like a diamond, but hitting in plain Sight. Gotta let the light shine, concealing it ain't right So I take my time, turn the page, make a line How I feel when I'm in the Mississippi state of mind When the cotton grows high, eh, the chair moves slow eh, The river belongs just to get us so home to me Thank you all so much for spending your evening with us tonight. And like I said, this is part of a, a program, a project called Southern Art Wider World, where we've the whole uh, fall and, and even before and now going into winter, we've been connecting Walter Anderson and his art uh, to all different manner of cultural themes from across the South and the nation and, and even the world. So this is our seventh program, the last program. And I do want to let everyone know if you've been tuning in from the beginning, the next chapter in this project is to archive all the work we've done, all the research, all the scholarship into a continuing education course and a mobile app. So that'll be coming out in the new year. But uh, this would not be possible without a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, additional support from the Mississippi Humanities Council. 
And then I'm in partnership with the Center for the Study of Southern Culture at the University of Mississippi. So thank you all for sticking with us if you've been um, attending any of these past programs. And for those just with us tonight, uh, we're thrilled to have you. We're ending um, kind of the dessert, if you will, of this of this whole project with food. We're going to talk about coastal food, the, the land, the sea, what geography can tell us and how that influences uh, the things we eat and how the things we eat are more than just nourishment, how they have a cultural life of their own. So um, before we dive in, I do want to go ahead and introduce um, our guests tonight. So this is going to work a little differently. I'm not moderating most of the conversation this evening. I'll be popping in and out, but we're very fortunate to have with us Francis Lamb, who's who's coming to us from New York. And you may know him as a, a, a judge in, in past years on Top Chef Masters. You may know his, his sultry voice uh, from The Splendid Table, uh, American Public Media produced a beautiful show, a wonderful um, kind of icon really in, in our uh, audio world these days. And, and Francis has, has been generous enough to join us. You can find his writings all over the place, New York Times Magazine, Bon Appetit, uh, Food and Wine, Savour, Salon, Men's Journal, it, it goes on. But he's gonna um, really revisit uh, this, this story because some of these, um, some of these uh, guests, actually both of them, Mayor Biloxi, Andrew Fofo Gillich, and Sue Wynn of La Bakery, who are themselves extremely important um, icons and, and kind of flagship personalities and in, in the coastal uh, foodways world. They were both interviewed by Francis after Katrina. So this is in some ways a homecoming for Francis, um, albeit virtually. So the first thing before we do get to Francis, who you'll see on the other side of this break, we always start with Walter Anderson's art. And, you know, people think of Anderson as painting wildlife, but he actually also painted people. And he was aware of aquaculture and economy um, living here on the coast during his time. So uh, before we get to the conversation, let's go into the vault. Just as Walter Anderson was depicting the natural environment of the Gulf Coast, he was also examining how people lived and worked within it. While many of his works that we are familiar with are of animals and plants, the items that we're going to look at today actually feature humans and how they interacted with seafood culture on the Gulf Coast. So we have these really beautiful pen and ink drawings of oyster shuckers, uh, and then we have two very intimate uh, watercolors. Uh, one is from a much further perspective and it's almost as if the uh, human in a boat that's on the water is melding with the water and you just have these little spires of the factories from the seafood industry in the background. The last piece that we're going to look at is of a man mending a net um, and it's a very intimate portrait of this man interacting with his way of livelihood. Even though Anderson loved being on the pristine islands of the Gulf Coast, he understood that nature and wildlife did not exist in isolation from humanity. And the food that we eat is a perfect example of how nature and humanity become one. So Francis, it's all on you, man. <laughs> well, thank you, Julian, for the introduction, and thanks, Ayer, for uh, the we met in the pre-show. Uh, I was really sort of mesmerized by that video, and uh, camera turned on me just as I was like scratching my head. I was like, "Wow, that's really cool." So thank you for uh, that very flattering angle. Um, and hi, Mr. Mayor. It's good, good to see you, Francis. Again, you're just like family, man. We spent. Uh, a, a number of hours and days together, so it's good to be here. But I'm like you; I was enjoying those those clips and and you know growing around. You know, food brought us you know to this country as far as the seafood mm -hmm. and industries. I mean, and it's so true. And I can tell you, you know, those things. You know, my home is is filled with Walter Anderson. You know, I've seen those things on the island as a kid. As I went to the island, what he painted a pelican, you know, in the sand, and and just you know, those people shucking oysters. I mean, that's for real. And, and it's all tied with food and it's all tied with our heritage and history. And I'm uh, appreciative of Julian to include me and, 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 and even Sue, you know, we've got, we go to we go back up, up the, a long way to what she does with our Croatian golf tournament every year. And uh, we'll, I don't know if you have enough time for us to talk about all that, but I'm, it's certainly great to be with you, Francis. And it, it, it's uh, just a, a pleasure. Yeah, it's been, it's been a while. So as Julian mentioned, uh, Mayor Gillich and I met, 
some 15 years ago after Hurricane Katrina, um, when I was doing an oral history project on the Gulf Coast for the Southern Foodways Alliance, and you weren't the mayor yet then. So <laughs> I'm to come back and, and, and call you that. Yeah. Um, and let's talk about Biloxi, uh, the wonderful city of, you know, Biloxi has long had this nickname of the seafood capital of the world, right? And right. what that meant is for over a hundred, you know, probably nearly 150 years at this point, fishing and seafood processing were such a huge industry there that many different communities came to Biloxi to find work. Uh, I believe it started with uh, Polish workers from like Maryland in the right. late 1800s, and then Cajuns from Louisiana and Croatians came, mostly as laborers, uh, fisher people, and eventually, you know, established themselves and came to own their boats and came to then own the processing plants and own the sort of industry. And then in the 1980s, Vietnamese fishermen started to come. And now there's a huge Vietnamese community there, kind of repeating that cycle. Yeah. And, you know, one thing that was really exciting to me about learning about all this is, you know, when you learn about histories, usually they're told in these big, broad brushstrokes. But in Biloxi, so many people have lived this history that they can tell you about it from their own eyes. So, Mr. Mayor, you know, you grew up in Biloxi when the Croatian community was in full force in seafood. Mm -hmm. Can you describe for us what it was like working in that industry when you were young, like even as a as a as a kid, I believe, right? Oh what yeah, you just doing and seeing. Well, you know, in my grandparents, you know, uh, right where all those casinos are on Casino Row, now those are primarily Croatian uh, shrimp and oyster and canning operations. But as you reach back, you know, around 1900, and you know, uh, prior to the Czechoslovakians and and the folks from, you know, they brought a lot of Croatians. And you know, one family, uh, just for me, one what part of my story was, uh, you know, my grandfather got here about 1903. And uh, then of his 13 brothers and sisters over to the course about 1920, brought them all here. And, and that's why we're related to everybody <laughs> here. But uh, no, the seafood, uh, the working, the, you know, the Industrial Revolution, even though it's before refrigeration, you know, the way you would, uh, you know, package and, and ship to the rest of the world. And, and we just happen to have a pretty good operation here with the number of canneries and shrimp and oyster. And, and you know, and uh, so I mean, the story is told, you know, we... Biloxi was founded uh, in, in 1699, but it, it, it survived and, and, and changed uh, its, uh, you know, it, its way of life. But 1900 uh, to, uh, you know, the, the immigrants got here by 1923. We, uh, we uh, were known as the seafood capital of the world, but, you know, uh, Croatians could sort of dominated that industry. Yeah, yeah. And you, I remember you worked, you worked in a cannery. Yeah, I, I tell I, I, people, you know, they ribbed me about, you know, he said, I've been here all my life and, and became mayor for, in a special election in 2015 and then reelected. Re but, you know, they, they talked to me about the job. I said, well, let me explain that job, this job, that I'm, which is 24 seven. I said, my first job was at my grandfather's cannery and uh, I was a can catcher. And that's uh, all of us cousins. Now I'm 11 or 12 years old and I was making a dollar 35 an hour then. I said, that's what I'm making right now, $1.35 an hour. <laughs> but it was. We would can after the, the shrimp was put in, you know, and, and the ladies along the line, they would put the shrimp tablets in and, and, and grade the shrimp. And these little squat cans, six-ounce cans, would be topped, and they would have to be taken after the tops were put on, put in a, in a rack for pressure cooking. And that's what our job, our cousins, you know, 11 and 12-year-old, we, we were working hard, you know, and, and processing Two or three hundred barrels of shrimp every day. That's two hundred ten uh, pounds per day. You go. There's a. There's a. That's probably a barrel. You know, in each one of those baskets. So uh, that was that was the deal. Did you ever sneak some off the line? I'm sorry. Did you ever sneak some of the shrimp off the line? No, I did not. It, uh, I, I didn't really. You know, it, it was just you saw so many. You know, you know, early on, I'm sure I did. And the oysters too. We, we did a little bit of that, but. Uh, you know, it was just it was it was work, but we had a great time, great experience. And then we would actually uh, at lunchtime go out and throw our cast net to catch some of the mullets that were, you know, feeding on the uh, the byproducts that would at that point in time go into. You see those nets, and oh, that's great. I mean, it's it's a uh, it was a tremendous. You know, I can't explain it to my kids and now my grandkids on on what it was like, but it certainly, you know, it, it was a tremendous experience for me. Bloxy, I couldn't have been 
you know, uh, in a better place, in a better time than Biloxi, Mississippi, you know, in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s. <clears throat> well, that's interesting because I, you know, a lot of industries that rely on immigrant labor um, and, you know, other form, low wage industries, essentially, there's often this sense that I think um, people work in it and, and a lot of times the attitude is, you know, we're working hard, we're doing our thing. But what we hope is that our kids don't do this. Right? That's what right. What we hope is our That's kids do something. Came, you know, my my parents and, and uh, my grandparents, you know, came over as deckhands and then uh, 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 captains and then processors and and the, and the first thing they did, uh, there was never a question about you know my path as far as education and, and uh, yeah, that was one thing that clicks and I see that especially you know in our community and the, mentioned the Vietnamese. You know, I, I, I look at. You know, attend every one of these graduations, and I'm telling you, the Asian community, as far as you know, honors and, and those, they, they in the front of the class, so they get it too. They get, they got that that thought on on what it's going to take, uh, and and the parents, and you know, the family strength uh, is is, is the, uh, the 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 method that you get that you know in, and and it'll carry you carry you to whatever level we have to face today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's interesting though, because I, I feel like it's probably kind of a complicated mix of feelings, though, right? Because on one hand, like you know, okay, look at yourself, like you just said, like you know, you you knew that your family knew that they they wanted to send you a path where you know you would attain a higher education. You know, you had a career in tech. Now you're in public service. You know, you're the mayor of the city, um, and so you know, there there's one way of viewing that that is about. Well, thank God I left all that behind. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it doesn't seem like that. You you seem very proud of the industry and oh, the community no, no, seem very proud of the industry. So tell us about that mix of feelings. Well, you know, you know, you start thinking about the whole path of life, you know, and had it not been for one of my distant cousins, you talk about Trouble Scumetta, we talked a little bit on the pre-show. Well, you know, one of his uh, uh, relatives was our, our double first cousin to my grandparents. He went to work in, in the... Uh, Lazaro Lopez canning operation. He said, you work like 10 men. Do you have any relatives? He says, I sure do. So he sent for my grandfather and, and all of his cousins. They came in 1903. And then it just, you know, it, it was viral. OK, so, you know, it, it, they brought hundreds and hundreds of, of folks and, and and they love, you know, the, the opportunity, you know, challenges around the world, I guess, uh, provide opportunity for for places and Biloxi was just happened to be that place. And Biloxi mm -hmm. was in the middle of a, a, a tremendous industry, the seafood industry. And, you know, things, it was a 15 or 20,000 folks in Biloxi, you know, it, during that time, but then came uh, World War Two, uh, and Biloxi jumped from about 15 to 20,000 to 100,000 almost overnight with Keesler Air Force Bar, Keesler Field. So, but, you know, still the processors, the canning operations, and they've changed their tune to, you know, about 80% of the, uh, uh, see, actually shrimp uh, were consumed in, in the country today are imported, but there's still, you know, ways and needs to process those shrimp. Uh, they just don't, you know, fall off and get to a restaurant. So that's, that's that, the complexion of that, uh, you know, that business has changed. You know, there was uh, uh, before refrigeration and now IQF, which is individual quick freeze, that's changed everything. So, uh, you know, some of these canners uh, can or processing operations, they do 22 million pounds of shrimp a year that go to uh, the different places. We, uh, you know, we, the challenge we had uh, in, in, in literally uh, around the world, Gulf of Mexico shrimp were the best and, and still the best. But what happened, and, and you could get a nickel, a, a 10, a 20, you know, you get what you pay for. And it was the best tasting, no matter where you are in the world. You know, aquaculture, some of the place, pond raised stuff, it doesn't compete with, with the, you know, the Gulf of Mexico uh, sh shrimp and, and, and the fish and, and, and the crabs and, and the oysters. But BP came along. And that, you know, perception changed almost instantly. And, yeah, and how do you horizon valorize oil. that? You know, how do you, you recover from that? And, and and then we've had challenges like the Bonnie Carey spillway, what was put, you know, the you know the whole world, at least our world, you know, uh, the United States of 37 states and a couple of provinces of Canada, 
you know, it drained through the Mississippi River system. And we just happened to be in a low lying area and they opened what was called the Bonnie Carey Spillway. And that devastated us two, two uh, summers ago, hurt the oysters. In, in, but, you know, we survived that. We survived the storm just the other day. And of course, now the pandemic, you know, with, you know, we, we've got 4.2 million visitors a year in Biloxi. And that's, you know, part of my business as mayor to make sure we're safe, friendly and beautiful and people want to come here. And, you know, we're hopeful of the, the vaccine and, and uh, you know, ending this pandemic. I, I know I, I missed spoke at, the, at one of the state of the cities early on in, in 2021 uh, or 2020. I said, uh, man, don't you just feel good about 2020? You know, and, and boy. I'm ready for it. To, you know, we've got 16, 15 days left. Yeah, I'm ready for it to be done. So, but you know me, Francis. Yeah, remember that? Remember when, when, when people were hopeful for 2020? Yeah, it, it's, it's over. It's a happy New Year. <laughs> happy end of year. That's right. I'm, I'm not going yeah. to predictions, so I'm done with predictions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to get out of the prediction business. And actually, okay, and then let's look a little bit back at the past for a moment, too. Um, I just want to ask you about some you know, when I first met you, um, it was because you had invited me to come visit the Slavonian Lodge, a uh, social club that started many, many years ago as a kind of... 1913. 1913 is actually when, when it was formed, you know, to help the living and bury the dead. And, and that, you know, uh, that was, the, you know, the need because, you know, not a lot of people spoke English and, and you had to, to get through. So that was the... We celebrated, you know... In, 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 uh, Third, two, 2013, 100th anniversary, but you know it, it's the story. It's the story of uh, you know family and community, and, mm -hmm. and it's a great story. That's why I'm so proud of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when I came down there to meet with you, there were a lot of folks there. It was during a, a, a dinner, um, and I met just these wonderful characters, folks. I remember <laughs> gentlemen sure. Corky Hire, um, trouble you know, folks who spent their oh, lives on the water. You know. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Tell us about some of them. Oh, that, well, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's you know as as they go through, they'll tell stories of you know uh, the drags that they made as far as you know the nets that they pulled and how many barrels of shrimp. That's you know your barrel was sort of equated to two hundred and ten pounds, and and you know even before then, yeah, there you go. See some of them that's that's getting ready to be you know uh, either uh, processed uh, or, or uh, uh, weighed. First of all, that's how you get paid on on, on raw weight. Now if I think, uh, you know, if you actually take the time while you're out at sea and, and pinch the heads off, then, you know, your your price per, you know, you, you compute how many shrimp are in a five gallon or five pound uh, situation. And so, you know, the more the bigger the shrimp, the more you get paid. So, you know, it, it's a it's a true art and science to, to maximize, you know, the amount of revenue you get. It's a tough business. It, no question about that. And so, you know. Uh, uh, there's so many factors, in, you know, uh, salinity of water, storms, uh, uh, everything in the world. So, I mean, it's, it's a tough, tough ball game. But, uh, you know, it, it's great, you know, when, uh, when, when the times are good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I love how you're just talking about it because it's clear to me that even, even as someone who didn't grow up doing this full time for the entirety of your life and your career, it, you have such a, a deep connection to it, not just as work and industry of a way to make a living, but as you're speaking of it as a craft in a yeah. sense, right? And and I think for that to connect with what we're talking about and how Anderson's art was related to his environment and inspired by his environment. Oh yeah. Craft is a product of that environment as well. Yeah. 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 So thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think we're gonna go, um, I think Julian has a, um, a video to show us, and then we'll see you in a little bit after a chat with Sue. Thank you, Francis. Uh, really enjoyed that conversation, and uh, can't wait for for the conversation to continue. But for all, for those who've been um, hanging out with us in past programs, we're fortunate to to be collaborating with Zaire Love, who is our resident uh, filmmaker. And I want to shout out Mary Blessy, another videographer and filmmaker who we've worked with on this program. So. Um, while we take a little break, um, we want to do that with a little more about uh, the seafood history and uh, the seafood capital that, that we're fortunate uh, to live so close to. For as long as humans have lived on the Gulf, they have lived on its seafood. Coastal Mississippi owes much of its unique personality to this intersection of the environment and the economy. 
take the city of Biloxi, named for the Biloxi tribe who originally called it home. The city has long been known as the seafood capital of the world for its production of all manner of seafood, notably crab, oyster, and shrimp. Since the late 1800s, this story of food waves and the sea has been driven by a cultural commingling of laborers, boat captains, and business owners whose ethnic roots originate from countries all over the globe. To understand food waves on the Mississippi Gulf Coast is to understand the promise of America, the notion that one generation's toil and grit gives to its descendants even greater promise. Well, the first generation that came over in 1980, it was a language barrier. They came from to a different country with no knowledge of what to expect, and the only skill they have is what they know. They know back in Vietnam is fishing. So they built they built the livelihood from around the fishing area, fishing business, and to support their family. And once they were able to support their family, they gave their children a better education better what than they have, you know. The waters of the Gulf of Mexico have fed this evolution, and the waters feed it still. And, and you know, it's right there, Mother Nature flies, why not go catch them? Hey, Sue. Hey, Francis. Oh, it's so nice to see you. Nice seeing you. I wish we were able to see you in person, but uh, definitely. No, no, no. I was so hoping that was the case. I come and eat some of your sandwiches and your, uh, eat some of your pastries again and your breads, but one day, one day will happen. And I do see. Dude, dude. I think you're in. I think you're in the bakery right now because I recognize yes, the wall. Yes. But you have a lot yes. more like awards and accolades and <laughs> behind you than I remember. Well, you, you know, you did come after Katrina, and <laughs> I probably had to replace a few things too. So yes, but um, I have been very blessed and fortunate uh, for the following of fans and uh, customers that we've had. So for sure, 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 sure. So, so, so as you know, Phil and I were talking about a minute ago. Uh, you know, obviously there have been distinct waves of immigration to Biloxi over its history and, you know, how that results today in Biloxi being this amazing mix of communities. But, you know, let's be honest, in the real world, mixing communities is not always seamless. But I think about something you told me but that has always stuck with me. And, you know, when I, you and I first met, it was at your bakery, Lay Bakery, it was six months after Katrina, and your uh, yours was one of four, I believe, food businesses that had reopened, like all of East Biloxi. And, you know, luckily for us, it was one of the best sandwich shops I've ever been to. But you, know, you also kind of became like the unofficial cafeteria unofficial for cafeteria. all the thousands of relief workers who came, as well as for your neighbors. And I remember you telling me that around that time that the community sort of shifted from calling your place the Vietnamese bakery on Oak Street to just calling it the bakery on Oak Street. Tell me about what that shift meant to you. You know, I, our family, you know, came from the West Coast. Uh, um, as far as like, you know, we were talking about like how the seafood industry brought um, the Vietnamese community down here. Um, my parents, you know, came down here, I think, with the notion that they were going to get into the shrimping industry. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's funny okay. that one. But, um, you know, as far as getting down here and, um, you know, starting the roots here, I, I we say we're Southern by choice. <laughs> so not necessarily native, but um, as far as, you know, being a part of this community and um, I think that that's just one of those feelings of that you are a part of this community, that you are, you know, not necessarily blazing, but you know, I feel like knocking down barriers, you know, through food and um, if we can get them through the doors, then we can find out that, you know, we have so much in common. You know, and it doesn't mm -hmm. matter your ethnic background because it seems like the, the 
common thing is, you know, food. So, um, and I think, you know, with our French bread, with the bread, you know, I think that was, you know, obviously the carrier of the seafood for a pool boy, <laughs> you know, or whatnot. So I think it accompanies it, you know, and complements it, you know, in that way. But yeah. um, just me. being, yeah. go ahead. Oh, no, no, go on, go on. No, also just, you know, being a part of this community, it's just, you know, it's, it's an amazing feeling for sure. Yeah. And, you know, you're, I love that you call them po' boys, your sandwiches, because you're in the Gulf Coast, like, a po it's it's a po boy. <laughs> but yeah, right. you know, if I'm coming from uh, my perspective, not being, you know, not having grown up in the Gulf, um, I came and I saw your sandwiches and I, and I would have referred to them as bun me, the Vietnamese word for sandwiches. Um, and, you know, again, it, it's that sort of idea of like what you call something matters. Uh, and in your case, it's, it's you know, the word, it's the phrase that um, is meaningful for your community. But tell me about the bread you bake, because there is this great Vietnamese tradition of bun mi bread, but your bread is not that style. Your bread is different. Tell me about how you were inspired to bake bread and how you, and your, and the, you know, what the inspiration of your style of bread is. I think as far as like, what you know, we interpret French bread to be. You know, I think I I I like different characteristics of bread, and I think I try to make this hybrid of uh you know as far as a French bread what we know you know I think uh you know obviously European style French you know that type of bread is that super thick hard crust you know um but then you also have to worry about you know the logistics of where we're living down here the humidity the types mm. of ingredients that's of as well as you know what people are used to down here you know um and i think that's kind of like everywhere you go meaning different areas you know of the country whether someone's into a sourdough or a hoagie type of bread um i think what we have it kind of hits on notes of so many different types of bread that's familiar to people because i mm. have so many people that come like oh it's just just like the bread i get from cuba or this is just like the bread that i get you know from here and there you know so i i think that's kind of like the common um there's there's things about it you know that's very reminiscent of other types of bread you know but yes um as far as being inspired for the type of bread that we make i think you know i think everything that i make here is basically inspired by what i like to eat you know or what mm -hmm. i find um is you know the appealing part of you know the products you know yeah, so yeah. And so when you bake a loaf and it comes out and you're like, well, I nailed this one. What is it like just to us? <laughs> uh, other than devouring it, I do need uh, guinea pigs that, you know, I need people like, hey, you know, what are your thoughts on this? You know, um, it's funny because like I'll, I'll have these um, almost like mad scientists slash, you know, visions of like what I would like to have, you know, if like, you know, this type of bread with this type of, you know, seasoning or this, that and the other. Um, it's, it's like I said, it's definitely one of those things where, you know, as far as being a foodie, you know, uh, just trying to explore different, you know, taste textures, you know, things that, you know, you find appealing, you know, so, yeah. but yes, nailing a bread that other people like is pretty amazing. Uh, I, I do love the part of, you know, as far as like here at the bakery, La Bakery, I, I love the fact that we are a part of people's lives, meaning from the beginning of it to even at the end, you know, whether it's for a wedding, a baby shower, a graduation, uh, you know, even funerals, you know, mm. I love the fact that we, um, you know, embodied in, in, in people's lives, you know, whether it's a celebration or whatnot, you know, I, I feel like we're at people's dinner for, you know, at Thanksgiving, you know, and that kind of stuff, you know, like they take a piece of us, you know, there. So, which is, uh, I love how we've become like tradition for a lot of families, you know, which is neat, yeah. you know, that's very yeah, important. Totally. totally, totally. And I know that that's, again, having lived there for, a, you know, even just a few months, knowing how central your bakery is, the community. And I remember you telling me at the time when, you know, there were certainly other bakeries you know that that um big bread in in the neighborhood but they weren't around and you know they hadn't come back yet and i remember you telling me folks coming up to your fema trailer in the middle of the night 
knocking on the door and being like, hey, you have any extra loaves? I just need some right now. Um, and, you know, having that kind of relationship with your, with your community. But take us a little bit further back. So you, um, you were, your, your folks came from the West Coast. Your family was living in California, originally from Vietnam, and came to Biloxi. And when you were growing up, I remember you telling me about your neighbors and meeting your neighbors and sharing your food with them. And, and I think what really struck you was how they shared their cooking with you. Tell us about them and what they and what you learned from them. We were very lucky to have neighbors that embraced our culture as well. You know, um, the families that lived on our block own what now is very iconic restaurants, you know, of Biloxi, you know, uh, some of them, you know, have already closed, you know, but it, one of the restaurants was the old Biloxi schooner. So as far as like that family, you know, being my neighbors, I had the best, you know, I mean, as far as, you know, coming over for a meal or leftovers or whatever, you know, I mean, I, I don't think I could have been uh, taught by anyone better, you know, if that made any sense. Um, and I think as a child, just being able to be introduced to different types of food, obviously be completely different from what we had on the West Coast, you know, growing up. Um, even like, I remember being in, you know, California, a lot of things were, you know, Mexican inspired, you know, and you've got the different, you know, type of, you know, when we say seafood on the West Coast is, is a different preparation and style than what we have on, the, you know, in the South. So for us to move down here, obviously it's not just um, my parents knowing like Americana, of course, being first generation immigrants here, you know, uh, my parents had always um, embraced of like, you know, learning how to cook, you know, spaghetti or, you know, other, you know, meals that were not traditional Vietnamese food. So I was very lucky in that sense. And the fact that, you know, my neighbors um, influenced me in my taste, you know, to what I like now and what I do, um, it, it all, I think it all is interconnected for sure. Um, just knowing that I, you know, could come over there and having some of the best gumbo ever, you know, um, I think that's, again, that's probably what as far as me to bake French bread, because I do enjoy eating gumbo with French bread, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm very lucky in that sense. And again, you know, where the neighbors would uh, benefit from my mom frying egg rolls or making, you know, fried rice or, you know, any of their dishes, you know, to do like a, almost like a neighborhood potluck in that sense, you know? Yeah. So. I love that. I, I love the idea other, of, a, of a block party with, with Vietnamese spring rolls and gumbo sitting right next to each other. And like, that's such a Biloxi scene. And in my mind, that is such an American story. That's such an American table um, and a Southern table. Like, um, so thank you so much for sharing that memory with me. And I have to admit that I, uh, you know, I'm on the East Coast. I'm a, an hour later than you guys. So I'm pretty hungry for dinner. Yeah. <laughs> Now I'm a little bit desperate for either gumbo or spring rolls. I'm not sure either of them is going to appear on my table tonight. But uh, so thank you for filling me with jealousy and FOMO. Yeah. Thank you so much for uh, doing this. I, I really do miss your face around here for sure. <laughs> we'll definitely have to um, reintroduce you back to Biloxi when you come down. Uh, lots of good eats, lots of good places to go to um, these days as well. So yeah, I'm excited for my next visit when whenever the occasion allows. So I think now we're going to go back to Julian um, for another film. This one uh, you get to star in, so that's pretty cool. Uh, and then we'll all get back together for a uh, conversation with uh, our audience as well. That's right. And Sue was so kind to uh, to let us in um, on a very busy. Every day is busy at the bakery, but on a, at a very busy time. And um, we were fortunate to be able to get into the kitchen and, and watch her, her do her thing. And so um, so we, we wanted to let you spend a little bit of time because we are in a virtual world, um, a little bit closer to the product, a little bit closer to the process um, and to the story of the bakery. For Biloxi itself, it's definitely an eclectic mix of uh, traditions, um, culture, uh, diverse ethnic background. I would say living down here gives me the freedom and opportunity to try different things. My parents fell in love with the coastal, you know, landscape, the people, the, the, the way of life. 
uh, they decided, you know, they were going to transplant the family and move to Biloxi, Mississippi. Everyone in my family is like all about, you know, food and culture. So whether or not it was coming from another country and knowing about American culture, whether it's a cake or anything else, I think my, my family has always like embraced that uh, difference and to say, hey, we're going to learn how to make this. Any given day that you would come in, obviously prior to COVID, <laughs> you would see um, all kinds of uh, races, economic background, uh, professions. Uh, I love the fact that we're kind of like a little area, you know, meeting ground for a lot of people. So you can have the old guys from the Sylvania Lodge be here to, uh, you know, uh, the mayor or, you know, city workers, construction workers, casino workers. But the fact that people can come down here and meet up and run into different um, backgrounds, you know, um, I think that's, that's, that's pretty amazing because I don't feel like I just cater to one type of crowd. And I think that's probably um, the most satisfying part. Uh, again, I think food is such a uh, it plays such a pivotal part in our upbringing down here, for sure. You know, maybe not the best for waistlines, but it definitely makes your soul happy. <laughs> so. Well, Francis, if, if you weren't hungry before, then, uh, I mean, good right. luck what I wouldn't give for a FedEx of those, those boat boys. Shout out to Sue's mom, master sandwich maker in the video. That's right. I mean, you, you know, Sue knows, um, you know, I've been trying to wrangle and set up this the shoot for a while when we finally got in to do it. But uh, so I think every time I came in there, she thought I was probably trying to talk to her. But it became clear after we we shot it, I was still in there every day. It wasn't to harass her. It was just because I couldn't <laughs> stop getting my bubble tea or my my bun me or my uh, bun bao, which is my favorite, the, the buns. Those are the best. So I, I, have, I have a real addiction when it comes to to your, your baked goods. Um, I do want to kind of pose a question to to everybody, and um, and we'll start let, with you. Yeah, Jimmy, let me let me jump in because Sue's so modest, but she's hit the mark. And I want to tell her she mentioned the Savonia Lodge. We're what a half a mile away from your uh, our you know uh, the we, where we rebuilt on Maple Street. She's on Oak Street, but uh, you know every year, Francis. I don't know if you remember, we do a, a big golf tournament for our fundraising. And now, 19, 2019, we had about 1,100 players over three days. Now, it was over six golf courses, and Sue will tell you that before 9 o'clock, every morning of these three days, we had six golf courses. And each golf course, she would these little pistolets, I call it, it was about a, a little mini uh, 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 pool boy that we loaded with roast beef on the golf courses. So her order was every day at these golf tournaments was six times 53 dozen. You know, and and that's what she would do, and they would pick oh, them up. I mean, it was, it's un well, you remember that? Two hundred fifty dozen a day. Thing. That's right for golf course. It was fifty dozen per golf course, so it's probably three hundred dozen, I believe. Wasn't it, Sue? Yeah. But uh, it's, it's an amazing. And the taste is right on, and and you know, uh, with roast beef and corned beef and everything else, it, it was more of a golf festival. So I got to you know give a Sue and and her family and operations the best. I know. Michael Kovacevic, his name, I don't know if you remember his nickname, uh, uh, Francis was Ubi. So Ubi and Sue connect every day pretty much in a lot of ways. So anyway, I, I just had to say that. It's just tremendous, you know, gumbo that we're talking about, that life in Biloxi. And, and that's what she had mentioned. It, it really is a gumbo. Well, Mayor, I, I wanna I want to ask you this question and then I wanna hear Sue and Francis on it as well. But, you know, we were talking about the, the kind of soul of a place and all of these different um, kind of cultural traditions and the ways in which food, in this case, brings people together. I mean, labor brings people together. I mean, the fact that you can, if you look back through the annals of, of Biloxi's seafood industry, you really do get a sense of, uh, you know, a microcosm for America, the ways that, you know, that, that labor and promise and possibility do bring people together um, across all these, you know, obviously racial and, and socioeconomic, all these different lines. Um, but I guess the question being, you know, as, as uh, 
for both Sue and, and the mayor. Mayor, you can start. And then Francis, more broadly, you know, wh wh what do you think that this um, this kind of cultural exchange, what does that do for the future of a place? As, you're, as, as all of us are trying to make our, our places better, um, I think in this day and age, we are so separated from each other. What, what do you think the idea that cultures um, can share and um, learn from each other through food, through art, through stories. Why does that matter? Oh, it, it certainly does. I mean, you know, uh, Biloxi has been around 300 years and every, you know, er, every talks about food of every uh, you know, kind. And it just it does bring people together. I mean, you know, just what, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a basic instinct to to uh, to appreciate people who can actually I'm a good eater. I can't cook anything. Sue knows, but she's right on as far as figuring out what we need to do and what uh, what's the best products. I know her apple turnovers I go crazy with every day. And, uh, you know, I don't think they made a lot, a lot of apple turnovers in Vietnam, did they, Sue? But, uh, but uh, they, uh, <laughs> they, you know, no question that uh, it, it brings brings everybody together. I, you know, it just, it's just the, the way of life down here. And, and you know, in Biloxi, um, you look at, you know, we are who we are. We don't try to pretend anything. And, and you know, I think, uh, you know, it, it, it's a way of life. And, and, and you know, you're welcome. You're welcome. That's all there is to it. And, and uh, you know, you don't have to pretend anything. And uh, we, we'll get on. And, you know, I think the rest of the country, uh, you know, especially when it comes to gaming and tourism and those people will start appreciation, appreciating that. And, you know, we're, We've got a, a couple of huge opportunities that for our kids and our grandkids, you know, with, with the different tourism and those kinds of things that are happening down here. And, and, and first thing, where are you going to eat? Where are you going to eat? What are you going to eat? What do you what should I eat? You know, when everybody said, where can I, you know, I'll point everybody to Oak Street right by the railroad tracks. That's where Sue is. So, you know, when when, uh, you know, the French bread, where can I get some good French bread? You know, I need to. Uh, so anyway, it, it does. No question uh, that. Uh, yeah, any place that has good food and, and just a, a good, friendly, uh, you know, outlook on life, it's gonna it's gonna be successful. I don't know if I answered the question, but that's you know that's the way I I feel, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Sue, I know when you're when you're baking a batch of something, whether it's uh, one dozen or two hundred fifty dozen, when when Fofo comes calling, um, you're, you're focusing on the craft. Um, but do you ever does it ever seep in? You know that the role that your that your restaurant plays. In, in Biloxi, I mean, not just the present of Biloxi, but I think I'm getting at is when you think about the future that you want to leave, you know, your son um, and how food actually does create conversations that probably wouldn't happen otherwise. The people that come into your baker, they're coming because they love the food. And I, and I speak from, I think we all can identify with this, you know, not always on the streets are these people talking to each other, but somehow when there's a, when there's something delicious involved, um, people can actually learn about each other. And do you think that goes beyond just the meal? Do you think these people coming together is, is beneficial for the long-term health of the community? Absolutely. I really feel like with food, that the connection for food is such a primal thing because it invokes all of your senses. So there is a connection as far as, you know, physical, you know, but there, it becomes an emotional thing as well. And as far as, you know, a social thing, it is where we interconnect with each other. Um, you know, this day and age with digital, you know, obviously it's so easy to get on your phone, um, not even talk to each other. Uh, and we're doing, you know, contactless type of things. But when you're having a meal and, you know, as far as like going to get the product, and having that interaction with people, obviously, um, I think the future of that meaning, like, you know, what gives me hope is because, yeah, you would say that you wouldn't see all these people in this area, you know, getting along. And I feel like a lot of people can learn from that as well. You know, there is this um, connection. Um, like I said, Alexi is a great place because I feel like it's different from, um, because of the culture, you know, um, how do we cultivate this? How do we keep it going? It's the traditions here in Biloxi. Um, you know, it's funny because even my husband who lives, you know, grew up a few cities over, doesn't have the same culture as we have in Biloxi. That's for sure. Um, but, you know, as far as uh, um, something for the future, you know, I think that's, you know, we have that common ground and that, you know, and that's the love of, you know, food and things and culture and, uh, and it's all, intermixed together sure so leaving something for the, the kids 
Well, Francis, I, I want to ask you. Grew up. I want to ask you a similar um, version of that question um, and also bring in a little more Walter Anderson work. So, you know, earlier we, we saw in, in the, the clip this, you know, him, him uh, depicting oyster shuckers and, you know, this um, almost Greco-Roman looking pot of harvest in the sea. I mean, these are archetypal images and his focus as an artist was um, primarily on the natural world. But you talk, Francis, to a lot of people from all over the world. Um, certainly, you know, when it, when it comes to the way chefs think about their product and, you know, how that that not only relates them to people eating their food, but where the product is sourced. And so that's another connection that I think we are losing in terms of our environment and understanding the value of that here in, in coastal Mississippi. And we're talking about Biloxi, you know, that that, pr that primacy of the, the water is really what drives all of this. You know, what would you say to these ideas about you know, not just the fact that people are connecting over food, which we all sort of intuitively know, you know, but what have you learned from talking to others and maybe reflecting on, on what we've talked about tonight about how, how food um, can really connect those tissues back to kind of our, our primal, more primordial cells where we really were just a community of, of kind of uh, human animals trying to, trying to survive together. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack there, uh, but maybe I'll, I'll speak to, um, even if I just touch on one or two of the, the pieces of your question. Um, I want to, I really appreciate this notion that food brings us together. And that's something that as a, as a person in food media, as a storyteller or in food for many years, that has driven a lot of my work and my career. But I want to complicate it a little bit too, by saying there's nothing really automatic about that. There's nothing inherent to the idea that people will come together simply if there's food in front of them. We just had Thanksgiving. You know, this year was a different Thanksgiving for many families. You know, we didn't all get together. But how many Thanksgiving dinners have you seen that uncle where you're like, I got to talk to this dude again? I didn't feel closer to him after that meal. In fact, I hated him a little bit more. You know, like, so, there, so there, there's nothing, there's nothing really automatic about food connecting us. But what I will say is this, the power of food is that it gives us an opportunity to connect one with one, one another. And that also means that we have to put forth the effort to listen to one another as we speak and to speak to one another. And we have to put forth the effort to embrace that power and to use that power. And what that power says to us, something Sue said so beautifully, like we are all like animals of our senses, right? And we're all animals with hunger. And in a sense, it makes us very vulnerable to share food with one another because we're sort of exposing that basic nature of ourselves. And in that moment, we can do the work of trying to learn from one another and trying to talk to one another and connect one another in, in, in a real way. Um, and I also want to say, I've been thinking about this a lot too in this moment of COVID and in this moment where small businesses so often restaurants of any stripe actually but in particular i feel for the small businesses the mom and pop shops uh because they're so economically vulnerable and what will it mean for us to to lose our locally owned restaurants what will it mean for us to lose those businesses not just the livelihoods of the millions upon millions of people who work in that industry and not just the you know, the dreams, uh, the life dreams, the life work of the people who, you know, start and run and, and, and own those restaurants, but also that space in our culture, right? The space where complete strangers come to a physical place to enjoy one another, to enjoy the people that they're, you know, they came with, um, but also the opportunity for us to, if we choose to in that moment, learn from the people who work there, learn from the people who are sitting at the table next to us, learn from if we're going to a restaurant that's representative of a culture that you know we don't know, we didn't grow up in, the opportunity to learn a little bit about that culture beyond, you know, what's the most delicious thing I'm gonna have tonight? Oh man, that appetizer was great. But hey, you know, where did this food come from? And what did it mean to you? Um, and I think if we're looking at an, a future where those spaces don't exist in our communities anymore or exist, you know, far few of those spaces exist in our community. I think we'll, it's gonna hurt us as a society. 
as a culture. I think it's incredibly damaging. It's not just, man, I'm a foodie. I love food. And, and oh, boy, it's a bummer that I don't get to eat that that noodle dish again. Oh, man, it's a bummer. I don't get to eat, you know, that that stew again. It's, oh, that's that's a whole nexus of stories and connections and empathy building and people learning from one another that is being taken away from our society. Um, and I, so I, you know, I, I want to get up a little bit of a soapbox and say, so it is on us right now um, to do what we can to support the businesses in our community in a way that's safe in, in a way that we're able to, obviously many people are, 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 are struggling right now economically. So it's not easy for, for everyone, but um, just to recognize that those businesses are a part of your life. They're a part of your community. They're a part of the world that you live in and they're what make um, the world that you live in what it is in, in a big way. And so not just to support them with our dollars, but to also call upon our elected officials, hey, Mayor. Um, but, you know, at, a, at, at the local state and federal level to support them in this time. You know, and, and you know, that's it's a, it's a place where like good politics and good business should be the same thing. We should be able to say, hey, let's be the richest country in the history of the world like we are so proud of being and let us use even a portion of that wealth to support our small businesses so they don't have to stay open in unsafe conditions and we can get over this damn virus so we're not all getting each other sick, you know, and, and have these businesses come back to. Um, but anyway, I'm sorry to, to, to start soapboxing and pontificating, but I, I just feel really strongly about about that and, and and small business owners like Sue who have the lifeblood of their communities in so many ways. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, and this is not, not to tag just a, a lighthearted note on something that I think people should um, take to heart. Everything Francis said is, is, uh, is what you should do and listen to. But I also wanted to say that Sue's son has the cure for COVID because we were over there and he was mixing in his little chemistry kit <laughs> and um, kind of re re reenacting her, her, um, her experimentation in the kitchen. And he, before, before I left, he gave me a little ramekin instead of soy sauce. It was this liquid that he had made me and it was the cure for COVID. So there, there's hope still in the bakery. <laughs> Well, I hope you're keeping it like negative 95 degrees. <laughs> well, um, I, I want to give everyone a chance for any, any final thoughts. Um, uh, Sue, Sue, is there anything, you know, if you, if you could sum up, um, you know, anything you want to add to this to, to just leave people with? Um, yeah, you know, I think when when I think about a, a business that the, a place couldn't exist without, I think about the bakery, even though we're in Ocean Springs and I love all my Ocean Springs businesses as well. But I, you know, I find myself going across the bridge so often to Biloxi because there's just something authentic and, um, you know, warm and, uh, you know, uh, kind of satisfying and nourishing about that food. But um, anything you want to leave people with tonight as they go into the holiday season and, and think about what really means to them, you know, what, what would you hope that they would remember? for giving me the opportunity and the platform to you know, tell a little bit about our story um, as well as, you know, the history or even, you know, what we do here at the bakery. Um, I really feel like for us, we're such kind of like a homegrown kind of feel to it. So I don't, I think when you go into the bakery, it's definitely not like any other bakery you've been to, if that makes sense. And I think that's kind of like, you know, what we would like to have you know, as La Bakery culture, meaning, you know, that you came for that experience as well. Yeah. Obviously now with, you know, with COVID restrictions of, you know, in and out, you know, but um, just to make our little mark on uh, Alexi, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. I really think um, everyone you know, and continue you know, the support of us as far as, you know, the business and not even just that, but, you know, the, the hey, how's it going knowing us by name and, you know, it's 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 a great community to be a part of, and I'm very proud to be a part of that, for sure. That's great. Well, Mayor, I'm going to give you, um, um, you give know, you, give you, oh, go ahead, Sue. That's like cutting out. So. <laughs> 
Yeah, Mayor, what do you say? I mean, I wanted to kind of yeah. hear from you. To, well, um, you know, Sue hit it and Francis hit it and you know it. And, you know, I couldn't ask for any better uh, a company to, to talk about these things. But, but you know, Francis, hit, you know, hey, we've got the opportunity to do great things. And, you know, and, and I think that's the beauty of our country. You know, Sue, is it, it, it you know, it goes right to your heart, you know, it, it, it you know, and just being here with y'all for it, it's just been a pleasure for me. And, and just a great, uh, you know, when you it all tied together and it still ties together. And, and uh, Francis, don't stay up in New York too long. We'll, there's a light at the end of this tunnel and we're going to get there together. And, you know, it'll be, you know, there's a, there's a bright future. The end, at least there's a light at the end of this tunnel. And, and I tell you, I'm ready for it to end. And so we can, you know, just hug one another and, and just connect and, and do the things that we miss so much. So, uh, I'm appreciative of, of being included in this panel, and, and it was just a just a great uh, great time together with you. And uh, uh, yeah, we'll do it again. Let, you know, Francis, you know, uh, call me anytime. And, and uh, same Sue, you know how to get a hold of me. She'll get a hold of Michael, and Michael will get a hold of me. So uh, it, it's uh, it, it's just a great uh, great place. No, no, no other place like this. Well, we, we will do it again and uh, we'll do it in person and we'll do what we initially planned before all this happened, which, which was to have everyone that comes to, to the real in, in-person event is to, to have something from the bakery. So um, I did want to, Francis, as someone did ask this question, and I think, uh, I think it almost was answered already, but someone did say when, when someone calls in with a cooking question, do you ever get inspired to go home and make that dish? And I think the, the, to bury the lead, are you going to go try to make some French bread right now? <laughs> I am not a talented baker by any stretch of the imagination, so I probably won't do that. Um, but yeah, it's funny. Uh, yeah, I mean, all the time. I mean, I think uh, for me, I um, I talk about food because um, you know, I sure for sure I, I talk about cooking food. Yeah, you know, I cook food because I love food, and I talk about food because I love food, but I care about food because I care about people. And when people um, take the time to call into our show and ask us the question about, oh, hey, I, I, you know, I'm having some trouble making this, or hey, do you have any ideas for me? I've got a, you know, I've got a special occasion I want to celebrate with my with my spouse or whatever. Um, these calls are great. And they're, they're, it's like people reaching out and, and showing us a little bit of their lives and um, connecting with us. And so it always feels, like such a privilege and an honor to get to speak with them. Um, and also, yeah, I mean, like it's, it's great in the, in the course of that conversation to, to get myself hungry a little bit too. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Well, y'all, y'all, I really appreciate everyone joining us. Um, I'm going to bring Zaire back in so I can thank her too. So just to say, Francis, thank you so much for your expertise and, and joining us in this, uh, in this medium and, yeah. and for, for being so thoughtful. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And Mayor, thank you for, for being a, a wonderful example of, of, a, of a leader who doesn't um, look back on his past with anything but pride. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Sue, thank you for feeding me almost every single day. <laughs> and Zaire, I wanted to thank you, uh, obviously, for, for sticking with me for, um, for this whole program. For anyone who hasn't seen the, the previous programs, and y'all can find all of those. Um, back in our archive, which is on our website at WalterAndersonMuseum.org. Um, but for uh, for that and for all of these wonderful guests, I'm Julian Rankin with the Walter Anderson Museum of Art. Um, until next time, you all have a wonderful holiday season. Uh, we're going to kick it out the door. Have a good evening. <laughs>